Okay, so we're live. So this is our first live behavior clinic. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, and we have got Lois, my fellow dog behaviorist here and holistic healer for animals. Got me, dog behaviorist and holistic healer for animals. <laughs> We've got a lot in common. <laughs> Um, and then we've got Karen and Kane. So Karen, you are one of our members who is kindly donated to our charity initiatives. And as a reward, I guess, for that, once a month, we do are going to do these behavior clinics where you can come on as a member and ask questions about your dog's behavior issues or quirks. I'm just going to double check. We definitely are in the group because of last, <laughs> last <laughs> month. We were just nattering away. Yes, we're here. So if you are watching, say hi and um, let us know that you're here and you can ask questions, questions about what, what we're going to be talking about, which is going to be mainly about barking by the sounds of what we were just talking about with Karen. Um, or if your dog mouths at you uh, or jumping up at people. Um, and we will aim to answer your questions if we've got time um, at the end. So, um, so yeah, so come and experience a live behavior consultation. This is what an online consultation would kind of look like, except that there are two of us. <laughs> um, so Karen, have you got, is Kane still there? He's lying on the floor at the moment. Okay, so maybe he'll pop up. Yeah. Um, but as you've told us, he is um, a Labradoodle, an all black Labradoodle, um, and he's 14 months old. And he, yeah, tell us, tell us a bit about what's going on for you guys. Okay, so I think the main issues are that he barks at anyone or anything that goes past the house on the road outside, um, whether that's be a person walking up the road or cars parking. Um, and it's particularly bad at night time. He does do it during the day, but I can usually stop him then, but it's worse at night. Um, and then also when he was a puppy, I did teach him um, the amount of mouthing that he was allowed to do without hurting you. Um, but I, I still can't get him to stop mouthing. So when he like puts his mouth on your hands or arms or legs sort of thing, um, and then the other thing is um, jumping up at people. Um, I, I do tell him to sit um, and he does do that, but then he's still too excited and then he just jumps up again. Well, Matt, was he, is he quite tall on people then? Um, I suppose he comes up to sort of my shoulders when he's jumping. Like wow. His head would be, but yeah. Okay, yes, I can see how that is, could be an issue <laughs> more so than like little dogs. Um, and then you were telling us that um, you did have some other issues with like pulling on the lead, but you've been to some of our loose lead classes. Yes, us. yes. So we went to the loose lead training and it took, took a couple of weeks um, to um, embed itself with him. But now he's much, much, much better um, walking down the road. He still does pull when we get into the woods or a field or something and he finds lots of smells. <laughs> um, but just walking down the road is so much easier. Um, oh, we, we've cool. been doing the recall sessions as well. Um, yeah. And that's still a bit work in progress with that one. <laughs> I shall let Vicky know. Well, hopefully Vicky will be uh, the trainer. Uh, hopefully she'll be watching. But yeah, um, I'm really glad that's worthwhile. That's part of our community initiatives to help. Like, yeah, recall yeah. loosely. Um, okay, so let's just see if anyone is watching. Um, so what, what we're going to do is just ask like a few questions just to get a bit of this context. We'll start with barking at everything. Um, some of the questions that I would want to know is kind of what your setup is in the house. So when you say it's like people walking past or driving, I'm imagining, do you, do you live on quite a busy road? Does he have access? Does he sit in front of the front window or what's kind of going on there? Yes. Yeah, so... We are on a residential street. Um, it's an estate where it's the only road in and out is the one that we're on, but there's other roads off from it. Um, the, the lounge window looks out on the front, as does our bedroom window as well. 
Um, so yeah, he can see out of the windows from both places we are during the day or at night. Um, I work from home, so I'm in the, we're in the lounge during the day um, and I've got a playpen. He used to use it as a puppy, um, but now it's more used as a room divider. Mm -hmm. um, so he can't get to me while I'm sat working. Um, but he can get to the windows. But he can get to the windows, yeah. But that is entertainment for the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and does he have like a little throne sitting in front of the window? Well, the armchairs are in front of the window, so he can jump up onto them and look out, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you that mostly nine out of ten clients that have barkers at things that are going on outside usually have a dedicated throne for their dog in front. <laughs> The television screen of the outside windows so yeah so we can help you right away just with the positioning of what you've done because <laughs> to, to be fair to him he's like I mean like a child why wouldn't I just sit in front of the television and <laughs> and bark because that's what makes gives me some joy um cool we might talk about territory and I'll leave that to you Lois because I'm sure you're going to jump in anyway um, but that will be like more of your specialism. Um, yes, uh, so, okay, so that's the setup. And then I would also want to ask kind of how long has this been going on? Has it been something like since he's a puppy, have you noticed anything else with him about, was he like a nervous puppy or a barky, sound sensitive sort of? Um, I can't recall if he barked that much as a puppy. Um... I think I was surprised when he did first bark. Um, okay, it's quite but a silent puppy it's then. probably been for since about six months. I would have thought. Okay, so a growing stage, a grow growth mm -hmm. spurt, hormones changing. Um, and was he a very quiet puppy then? Because that would raise some questions in terms of was he nervous at all, or quiet, overly introverted, or quiet? Um, I think I probably struggled to socialise him as a puppy. I struggled to find any courses um, and only found found you guys more recently. Um, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't manage to find puppy training courses when last summer. Um, OK, so is he kind of does he feel quite frustrated? Does he pull when with, with the pulling and stuff, is that a frustrated pull to see other dogs or? He he really he really wants to go up, say hello, and play with them. That's 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 how we he he lies down and he just wants to get up and and play. Um, okay. So there might be a feeling of lack in him, which is making him overcompensate for that by being more overly like, play with me or jump up at you, give me attention, because there's some sort of lack from a child childhood puppyhood <laughs> sort of thing. Sorry, I was doing a different therapy thing just before this for a human. So, <laughs> but yeah, you know that I call my dog my child anyway, Lois. So um, that's a whole different ball game. We won't go down there. Controversial. Um, Okay, so yeah, I'm getting a good picture here. Um, worse at night, um, and then I'm going to hand over to you, Lois. That's just my last question was, but oh, and also I'd probably want to ask about have there been any changes around the six month time in your household or just changes in your household? But before I ask that, when you say worse at night, what's going on at night? Can you give us any idea why? Is it louder at night or is it because it's night dark time? I is it think different? it's probably because it's dark, it's night time. I'm trying to sleep and then suddenly I'll start barking and, I'll, and I'm woken up. Um, you're you're woken up or he's woken up? Well, I'm, wi I'm woken up because he started barking. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's... We, because we're the thoroughfare into the road, everyone pretty much goes past the house. And I think it's when there's someone talking, if they're walking up the road talking, it's the noise that that sort of he he hears and okay he's then looking out yeah yeah so I'm picking up on some sort of nervousness like it's a bit more scary are you picking up this too Lois it's a bit more scary yeah. at night time there's a bit more security alert going on for him 
mm. feeling a bit more vulnerable. Everything is maybe a bit more accentuated, like the noises are louder when that dust, especially, is it more around dusk or is there a change or is it like later on? No, it's later. Oh, okay, later. Um, and yeah, okay, so that's that's really interesting. Um, Lois, do you want to chip in? Because I've been talking and maybe just cover the any changes that might have happened. But have you got anything to ask? Um, no. <laughs> I'm all good at the minute. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll carry on then. So, um, yeah. Karen, have there been any changes? No. No, okay. So it has been... Uh, you've been well, on... actually, sorry, thinking about it, my husband works away during the week, but there was a three month period where he wasn't working. So he was at home. Yeah. So both of you were at home. Yeah. And now and that's his like puppy memory. And then now is it is that right? No, so that that probably came in at about his six months. Okay. Thinking about it. Yeah. All right. So something so something did. It's usual that there is some kind of change in the environment around the time so that makes sense so he was so your husband was at home at about six months stage for about yeah. three months and then he went back to work so that's yeah okay so changes during that kind of adolescent mm -hmm. uh, time um yeah okay well Lois what would you say first of all what would we what would some advice be put you on the spot <laughs> Throw it back to me. thanks for that <laughs> you know I like to because I, I don't like the sound of my own voice. I've been talking a lot. Let me just re-engage my brain. No. Um, right. Okay. So I think in terms of, I'm trying to think the best way to come at this. Um, when I look at, and this is just something that someone's put in my mind. I've done this for years. And then someone said, use it as a foundation analogy. And actually I thought that makes genius. Just genius. So. I want you to think, and I did a post today, we used to say puppies were blank canvases. When in theory, they're not. They're a bit like a sponge with a blueprint. <laughs> so they learn everything, but they've got, they've got a built-in blueprint. <laughs> so they absorb everything that we put in, but they have got a blueprint underneath them. So I want you to think of blueprints almost like the ground level, okay? Now, if we're then going to build a house and build what we want and everything that we want the dog to kind of go through and fit into our life, we then build on top. Okay, so that's you're like building a house. However, the house doesn't stand upright if the foundations aren't in place. So the foundations are where we've got to look at when we and build on the foundation layers to then eventually, if we make sure all the foundations are set, the dogs kind of roll out as a happy-go-lucky, love and life, chilled individual, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? <laughs> so when we look at foundations, I'll run through them very quickly because actually these are going to tie in with A, the barking and the jumping up and everything else <laughs> with a couple of tweaks on the top. Um, so right at the bottom of your foundation thinking, we've got health and well-being which Nikki, you can talk into that one a hell of a lot more than I can. Um, and probably the biggest overview that we can look at. So we can look at all aspects from diet to general health, to pain issues, to hormones, because we're, we're dealing with a, an adolescent dog that they're very easily frustrated and life bless them at this point in the game. Um, given the noise sensitivity, are we looking at a, at a potential health, health piece in there that needs to be in looked at and delved into above that you've got feeling safe which is where I've come back to and I think is where Nikki's landed as well um especially with the night time and not being fully settled this not being fully settled could also link into a health and wellness piece which I'm exploring with one of mine but does he feel safe is his environment safe does he need a den that kind of thing what do we need to change in the environment to help make him feel safe it's no you know, there's no judgment or anything else. We all have to, we have to tweak because every dog's something different in that sense, Nikki, aren't they? You know, I've got some that if you take away the crates, there's, it's like the sky's falling out down to earth. It's torture. Whereas I've got one that would live under my bed if I let her. She's not allowed to live under my bed, but that's past the point. 
So we've got feeling safe. I think that's where we've landed in, in that land um, for noise sensitivity. Up from there, you've got activities that are breed specific or suit the individual. I would say you're hitting the nail on the head there. You're meeting his needs in the sense of he's getting his daily walks. He's doing lots of activities. So he's doing trick training. He's doing training classes, all that kind of stuff. Enrichment, anything like that, all kind of fits into that. Keeping them occupied so you have a life. <laughs> so he's not destroying the house. Um, communication, so body language, which is a whole other ball game and one that we can certainly delve into in coming sessions, I think, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Self-management, so arousal levels. This is where I think every adolescent dog falls in a heap. <laughs> because in adolescence, dogs hit adolescence at six to nine months. And at six to nine months, they learn two questions. No, I'm not doing it. Two statements. No, I'm not doing it. And why do I have to? I find all adolescent dogs, they learn a level of impulse control as puppies. And then it kind of gets flung out and shoved on a shelf in adolescence and we go no we don't need that we'll just leave that over there <laughs> and we're going God, it's torture puppyhood is easy compared to what comes next in, in terms of adolescence so I would say arousal levels is a big thing that we've got to play with with all adolescent dogs it's not just your boy um and we see arousal levels differ between male and females so I think males in my sense um male dogs in particular I find are more easily frustrated and some of the females, however, that the females, the females are more tetchy with it, which is just great fun, especially when you've got a household of the buggers. Um, flexibility is the next one up. So learn and adapt. How flexible is he to change in routine? How flexible is he to life? Um, Something that we can grow and shrink on this one, flexibility, I think. I don't know if you agree with that one, Nikki. I personally don't like strict routines in my dogs because I find it causes anxiety. Um, yeah, I find it depends. Some right. really Some need it. Love it and, and need it, yeah. Others, it, it causes, you know, they're like, oh my God, I've missed tea time. I've missed yeah, tea time. Yeah, I've yeah. Missed it and I can't it actually causes the obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, fuck. So I think we've got to be flex flexibility. How does the dog cope with flexibility in the, in the lifestyle? And then confidence is a big one. Confidence can also tie in massively with your barking piece. Um, yeah, I've written in as well, which is where we go. Yeah. So my big areas, I would say, if we're looking at the foundation piece, I think we're definitely looking for barking. We're looking at confidence and feel safe and possibly health and wellness. And yeah. I'll explain health and wellness more when we get to jumping up and mouthy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Actually, at the beginning of a session, I usually always ask what food the dog is on as well. I find that is one of the crucial questions, interestingly, for behavior. So what, what food is Cam? Um, so he is on nature's diet, um, wet food, and with a bit of oats. It's a, like an oaty mix. Um, but then sometimes as well, usually once a week, I'll cook up um, some mince meat with uh, vegetables, oats, and like bake that up um, and give him that. He's he's very he's always been very um, choosing when he wants to eat. He will eat sometimes and then other times he won't. So, mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he's picky. He's, he, yeah, he's very, yeah, very picky. And if you give him the cooked food, is he picky then or will he wolf that down? Um, when it's freshly cooked, he'll eat it straight away. Um, <laughs> when it's cold, thing. when it's cold, he'll eat it when he feels like it. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah. And yeah, I've, I've tried heating it up. And it's again, he'll eat it when he feels like it. Okay. So he may have, this could be a health, part of the health dynamic is that he may have like a poor appetite and there may be something <laughs> digestive going on there. And anything to do with the stomach and digestion can be with an insecurity and anxiety issues as well. So it's usually linked. 
Very interesting. So Merlin is very similar to that. And he loves, well, he loves raw food, but if I'm going to cook food, it's got to just being cooked. I can't then go put it in the fridge and offer it to him the next day. He's like, and yeah, I've tried to microwave it or, you know, even put it in the pan and heat it up. No, um, it's that because it's freshly cooked, it will help if they've got like um, a lack of poor appetite, those smells and aromas yeah freshly cooked is going to really help stimulate and get the saliva going and it will just help with that appetite so I would play to what he's telling you so at the moment like of course that's a big job for the rest of your life yeah. to be cooking for your dog but some people do it and love it um I'm not one of them but um I would certainly at this point play to it um also you're giving him fresh real food which is going to be amazing what you can add in are things that are good for noise sensitivity and anxiety would be like oily fish, um, like sardines, sprats, um, tuna. Yeah, like kind of all the oily. Um, you can give raw. Um, have you got anything against raw, by the way, before I say anything? I have. Yeah, because, that's fine. Because he's very licky. Okay, yeah. So it's personal preference. So that's fine. But um, so I would just get things that are not raw then, you know, like in a can, you know, sardines, mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'd be adding in the oily, oily um, fish and I would, yeah, I would cook things up for him. Oat, oats good for anxiety. Oats are good as long as there's no intolerance. Yeah, yeah, no, he does seem to be okay with, with oats. Yeah, um, that's good. And, and if he needs more crunch, you can put those like fish crunchy square things in, mm -hmm. treat sort of things, you know, if you're worried about that. Um, Okay, good. I don't know nature's diet wet food, but it is a processed food. So it's unlikely to be giving him an optimal diet um, because that's just not, you know, it's more of a commercial food. Um, so yeah, I would, I would be cooking it up. And then if I was treating this from like a, a remedies point of view, I would give something like basil is very strong stimulant for the digestive system and the appetite. Um, so, I mean, that would be like a different session, but that would, would be like canine self-selection. So we would offer like a remedy in an oil form, see if they show signs of needing it, the body will tell and show signals if they need it. Um, and then that would be something to also be helping with that because when the appetite's working and when they're getting all the nutrition that they need, it will, they'll be less reactive to things because they're, you know, their nervous system will be calmer. Um, they've got if there are things that freak them out they've got nutrients to draw on they've got things to rebalance and if they're not there in the diet or there's something going on that's depleted like the depleted digestive system it's a bit more sluggish than you you know some of these things like the noise sensitivity um i would also probably treat the liver as well but that's kind of probably a different session that would be a canine mm -hmm. selection um, but we can do a lot with that um and sandalwood would, and violet leaf would be my main things for, sat, for noise sensitivity. I was just saying that just bef before, wasn't I? Um, yeah. So, because Lois, I think you've got one of them, have you? Yeah. <laughs> Having my life. <laughs> so, yeah, I would start with that. I would start from the nutrition and the body, and then I would work on what's being expressed because of the imbalances within within the body and because he's so young it's wonderful to catch at this early age and to really optimize you know that but you can work on this at, at any age as well um so that would be my piece on on that and then I would definitely be going around like what Lois was saying about a den and I'll let her carry on with that but I would I would just to follow on from what I was saying is your setup is you're setting him up for, for failure with the being by the main window. So if you are looking to segregate, then I would be putting him in an area which isn't by that. But then what we need to do is then supplement him with things he can be doing because he needs, you've taken the television away and now, you know, he might be barking because his television's gone, you know, so you kind of have to supplement that. But, um, but Lois, do you want to talk about like setting up the den and where and, and the enrichment and that kind of around that? Yeah. Um, so two things I would, well, a few things I would do. In terms of your management piece, you can change around your room so he's not rehearsing and watching that television all the time. It's majorly exciting. Um, however, if that's not doable, depending on your setup, depending on the house, because it's sometimes not, 
a quick fix, well, not a quick fix, but a temporary thing that we've got up in this house because we've got a very, very barky dog and she's allowed to look out the window. So we've put the, the sticky frost in on the window. <laughs> okay. Just up past, just up to like a midway point. So it's blocking her line of sight and it lowers because she can't see it. She can still hear everything. So we've still got that issue, but it has made a, a significant dent on that rehearsal. She can't just sit and watch out the window now and bark. So that is an option as well. Sticky stuff on the window. And once you're done, you just peel it off, put it in the bin. Amazon's finest. And then you're not sitting blacked out or anything like that. <laughs> not looking unsociable to your neighbours. <laughs> um, well, you know. Um, so that would be kind of your first first line of management for breaking that that watching the watching the television. I love that. It's great. Um, never thought of it like that. <laughs> Love it. Um, in terms of, I would, I always give my dogs a safe space. So we create, sorry, we create dens in this house. Um, whether it is, guys, enough. Whether it's a pen, um, a crate, um, a room with, you know, with like a bed tucked in the corner where it's nice and chilled there's there's no right or wrong it's what's right for the dog so what works for one will work for another and I would do boundary training which is have you got anything set up for boundary training in workshops Vicky uh, Nikki we do in the don't you dare classes that are starting okay. yeah this month Might be an option. Good, aren't we? yeah that will be a boundaries will be a big thing but do you want to just go into that a little bit for people that don't know yeah. boundary training um so boundary training is ultimately just creating a safe space where your dog is allowed to chill and relax until they're released out. People take it to the extreme. I don't. My dogs can come and go out of their boundaries as much as they like in this house. Um, if I have a guest coming in, then they're put away in their boundaries. And that boundary can be a room. It can be a crate. It can be, you know, behind a baby gate on a raised bed. It doesn't matter. Um. But in terms of just building that den, I would create a nice safe space, feed them in there, give them lots of treats, um, just to build value and wanting to be there and allow them to go and explore it and come away as he pleases, especially if we've got a slight insecurity issue. Um, but it is somewhere I would build to be very, very exciting in, in just his space. No one's allowed to bother in it, bother him in his space, it's his. Um, so that is one piece I would do. Additional brain stuff. So if we're going down the lines of labradoodles, so we're looking at, well, anything scent work, anything generally that involves food, really. But fussiness, however, I was having this discussion with behaviorists yesterday. Doodles are notorious for being fussy eaters. Because the gut issues and poodle and yeah, doodles, sorry, are huge. So that's really, really interesting that it popped up. Um, but you can utilize some of the daily food allowance and make them work for it. So stuff that wet food in a hoof or on a licky mat or in a Kong. It doesn't have to get it out of a dish. Um, anything that's dry, you can do little scatter feeds or interactive mats. Um, Cardboard boxes are a firm favourite in this house. They turn to confetti. It's great. <laughs> is that a nod, Karen? Does he like? Yeah, he likes cardboard boxes. Yeah, it's always good fun, isn't it? And you're like, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> Amazon delivery. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Anything like that to yeah. give them that alternating. We're not watching the telly all day. We're going to use your brain. Twenty minutes of a of the dog of your dog using their brain is equivalent to a two hour walk give or take so it'll give you an indication of what should follow 20 minutes of him using his brain yeah, yeah no that's brilliant um also I would ask Karen in the classes that you've been doing um when he's working for food do you find that he's more motivated how is he with the food and in the classes he he was would really react um yeah he he's wanting the food when I'm when we're in classes and 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 even when I'm doing those those out in the garden as well or out on walks he's straight there for the trees well, that's good. but yeah it's I've not used his normal food for that so I don't know how that would react 
he'd react with that. Yeah, probably. Well, yeah. if you, you if you play to again what he's telling you, I think yeah. that. Um, and then what I would do is you can also get like for real food. I think you can get these squeezy things that you mm -hmm. can put food in and you squeeze it out as the treat. You know, because yes. it's kind of difficult to pick up. I don't know what you're cooking, but you know, <laughs> yeah, if you're putting it into something, then you can oh. take it out as the reward, a little by little. Yeah. Um, but also hiding, like just simply, rather than feeding him out of a bowl, is hiding his actual food around the garden you mentioned, or around, you know, under pot things, or in little by little like container yeah. things that, that make him work for it. Um, and you can also, like in a class environment, start with those basic things that you've learned you know, to get him to work for the food that will start the saliva going, will start the digestive system working. And then he will likely eat, eat the food and then go for the enrichment toys and things that have got the food in there because you've excited him to do that. So, yeah, we've got like, basically we've got, we've got to deal with, we can do the management piece, which is really important, but we do have to deal with what is motivating the barking, which is kind of like a boredom or frustration or yeah, those kind of, Thing. So we need to give him a replacement um, for that and make him work. And, and what is good is it doesn't have to take much of your time, like three minutes, five minutes to do a couple of things you've learned from the classes. You know, maybe has Vicky, have you done a middle or something? I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. So like that would be a perfect one or like weaving them or even just twirling them around. Twirling's not the right word, but... <laughs> Spin, that's it. Thank you. Just starting to get them like, oh, okay, I'm excited for it now. And then they go into their own activity. Because I think it's be quite, if you're working from home and you're with them all the time, it will also be, and you're wanting to build the confidence, you'll be wanting him to do things on his own mm -hmm. as well as you. But you might have to start it and get him interested. And then come away. Yeah. So he's kind of building up his confidence um, piece. Um, what about the feeling? Say or did you want was this Lois do you want to move to the mouthing or what do you want to hey, mouthing so <laughs> mouthing and jumping up probably interlink we're coming back into this health piece particularly with jumping up um so there is again there's there is management stuff we can do around mouthing so you feel it's just for um when he's wanting your attention I think so yeah Okay. What's he like? Does it happen when he's excited or over yeah, the top? It yeah, he probably is. Yeah, it's probably is when he's excited, when he's trying to get when he's trying to get my attention. Um, yeah, and the jumping up particularly is if you if you've been upstairs and you're coming down, if you're coming in the house, um, it's those sorts of times. Okay. What was I gonna ask? Dear God. Oh yes, what have you tried up till now? So with the jumping up, I've tell him to sit. Mm -hmm. um, he'll sit and I won't come through the gate. Like we've got a stair gate. I won't come through until he's sat, but then as soon as I open it, he's jumping up. So you tell him to sit and it's you're repeating it all the time. Um, and I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. Okay. And the mouthing, what else have you tried? Um, trying to step, tell him to stop. Um, I don't know. It's just That's trying right. to get him off. Just trying to get him off. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to deal with it, really. Okay. That's fine. I'm just, I just want to make sure that you haven't <laughs> tried anything and then I tell you to go and do it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then it doesn't work really for anyone. Um, okay. <laughs> Jumping up, we'll come back to you in a minute. Um, mouthiness, I've got a couple of different ways that I deal with it, and I probably deal with it slightly backwards to everybody else in the sense of, especially my youngsters, I, so not when they're in that naturally mouthy state, but there are times when I go, you know what, to help you realise what's acceptable and what's not, I will initiate play generally with a toy. Um because you want them to be excited over a toy, but not touching your skin. Um, and all mine learn very quickly that if their mouth or their teeth or anything touches hands, all fun stops, play stops, that's it. It's all they learn. 
So there's no nastiness in it because it doesn't need to be. It's just play, play, play. It's fun game because, oh my God, I'm playing with mom and a toy and it's just, it's epic. If content, and then as you want to keep these play sessions short and, short and sweet, so play, play, play. And then when you want play to stop, deep breath out, release everything off and just chill. And you will see the energy levels come down. Everything becomes very still. If you find at that point, which I suspect you will, he'll go, oh, hang on a minute, I still want to play and I'm still gonna be mouthy because I can. A couple of different things you can do. You can drop the toy and walk away. You can, if you know that you're definitely gonna do it in a very structured way, drop the, finish your play with the toy, scatter a handful of food, play stops. That scatter feed brings that surge of energy right back down onto the floor. And chill. If that still continues, so yeah, I don't really want the food on the floor. Look, we're still playing this game and it's still majorly exciting. I'm still going to mouth you, walk out the room, say nothing, all fun stops and ignore them. Walk out the room, shut the door behind you. Got a baby gate, just leg it over the baby gate, depending on your setup. When he's calm and chilled, you go back in. That's it. That's how I start, start mouthing. Very, very easy. It's something that all my dogs learn very quickly just because there's little people running around in this house on, on occasion. Um, but as soon as, and you set the tone, so it sounds like you've done really, really well teaching them what's acceptable and what's not. Take it a step further. As soon as he touch, goes to mouth or touches or anything, it should be feather light. As soon as he touches skin with teeth, all fun stops and walk away. You'll soon learn that it's not what you want. Oh, that doesn't get me the thing. I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the easiest one for Mao then, personally, I've found. Yeah, and engage his brain into working out, oh, how do you calm, or, you know, how do I self-regulate as well? Yes, coming into a self-regulation piece, yeah, massively. Yeah, but I, I like the idea, that the thing is that he, he needs something so you can, like I was saying, it sounds backwards, but you give him what is acceptable to be mouthing. And oh. then, yeah, and, and the, the thing of like dropping, immediately dropping really works. So like recently Merlin has been barking, if I hold the ball up and go towards the water, because I want to put him in the sea to cool him down, as soon as I pick that ball up, he's like, <laughs> and I just do that, I just open hand, drop ball. And he's like, oh. He's like, what do I do now? <laughs> Am I going to pick it up? And if he, if he starts, you know, it's quite dramatic. I'm showing him very obviously what's happening. So it's like all, all play stops. And, he's like, oh. and then he stops and he can throw or do something that he does want because he's not barking or things like that. But anyway, that's going back onto a barking. But it's kind of the same thing of right. demanding, you know, like or needing the attention, needing being stimulated. Because he's probably got into a habit of you coming through baby gate. This is what I do. Or Hi. yeah, that's like, so it's like going from like, bing, that's what I'm going to do. So you need to just be like, okay, or well, arms are down and away, or I turn around or baby gate closes and I reverse, you know, it's a bit immediate sooner. And then it's like, okay, he's calmed a bit. Now I can try and repeat tentatively. But if he starts, I'm showing him clearly, very clear with body language. They really watch everything that we're doing. So yeah, I really like that, Lois, that whole, that's really cool. Um, the jumping up. jumping up. This is actually quite a juicy topic when you get into it. And we could go down quite a rabbit hole with jumping up. However, a couple of things I will say for jumping up straight away. And I think it'll be a, it, ideally needs to be a comeback session jumping up mass is massively affected by pain now it's not to say that your dog's legs are going to drop off or anything like that because it doesn't mean that at all pain in a dog can be tiny and it could just be linked to the fact that he's also a fussy eater if we've got a gut issue that we need to address and establish um and the reason it's and a lot of people say well dog wouldn't jump up if it's in pain because it's jumping up and it's putting all that, it's changing all the, you know, it's weight around in its body and it's putting quite a lot of excess um, stress on its joints. When your dogs are in that hype state, they get that massive adrenaline pumped through their body. 
and it blocks pain. It's a blocker. Hence why you get dogs that can't settle. I've got one that was like a light bulb moment when I had this conversation with someone yesterday. I was like, why haven't I thought of this already? Um, because she can't settle. She can't physically switch off unless it's in a crate. She doesn't jump up. She, she just paces constantly. And I've had just had the light bulb moment of, can she not settle because she's in that much pain? And funnily enough, she doesn't, she settles when she's given CBD oil. Well, I thought that was helping with anxiety, but clearly not. So back to the board game on that That's one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good for pain. Um, yeah. So I think in terms of jumping up on a long-term basis, it's going back into that health and wellness piece and making sure, okay, hang on a minute, let's, let's have a bit of a delve around in there and see what could be triggering the response that we're seeing. Again, massive issue in, lab, in doodles specifically across the board, not just one specific um, like labradoodles or cockapoos. We're seeing it in doodles across the board for whatever reason, mostly coming back to the gut. So it seems to be that link there. Um, however, in terms of moving forward to help minimize it, you're not doing wrong by asking for a sip. What I would personally do for coming in, especially if it's happening when you're coming back through the door, is my dog, one thing I think we can all benefit from teaching our dogs is presence doesn't mean access. And this is a big thing for me for coming through the door. I have a lot of dogs in this house. <laughs> I'm not gonna put a specific number on it. <laughs> However, you come through a sea of dogs to get into my house and they do jump up at times because they know they can jump up. And to them, it's just that we've got an attention thing going on. But one of the things that they learn very quickly is when I come through that front door, they don't get my attention until they are calm. So even if they jump up at me and I don't, you know, knock them over or anything like that, I just pretend they're not there and just continue walking. They're like, hey, she's, she's boring. As soon as they're calm, oh, hello, I'm here. What are we gonna do? And I do it that way. Um, other way, and it is, I think, jumping up as a management piece is just teaching them better things happen when four feet are on the floor. Mm -hmm. So it's everything that you can keep their focus down as much as possible helps. <laughs> Sorry, it's a dog that doesn't like anybody. Um, <laughs> keeping their focus down as much as possible will help massively in the long run to stop that rehearsal of jumping up. Because even when they're jumping up, they're still getting your attention because they're up. You can't really ignore them when they're up here, especially when you've got the bigger one. And you're like, you're in my face. So it's not good. <laughs> So if we can teach them that, okay, when you are up here, I want to think that you're not, so I'm going to ignore you as best I can. As soon as their feet touch the floor, good, hello, speak to you now. If they come off as you do that, it goes back to the ignoring piece. And that's probably the best management piece I can give for, re for jumping up as a side note until you understand, until we figure out what's going on underneath. Don't know if you've got anything to add there, Nikki. Yeah, I think definitely four paws on the floor and you can do that as part of the trait, the three minute, mm -hmm. five minute training is like, you know, you can do feet work as well and, and get him to understand, you know, four paws or some kind of signal word for it. So that always gets, you know, rewarded um, and redirecting with scattering or coming lower and getting attention into other things rather than that jumping up. Um, I think that would help to rewire that I have seen like some of the absolute oh well you're an you do some absolute dog stuff they actually teach jumping up as you know when you're coming from yeah. a backwards way they teach jumping up yeah. so that they know that there's a time and place and then they get rewarded for that oh it's time to jump up yeah. you, know? you can put it on cue yeah so all know? of my spaniels are on cue so if I say come on I put up they'll jump up as soon as I say down they'll get down Okay, so the, there's understanding those words and what, yeah. and what does this mean? And how did you get them to understand the, the, the down bit? Taught them feet on the floor first. <laughs> Teach that behaviour in the background and then it's, it's easier to... Who have I got to have? Give me a quick, oh, I've got one up at the minute. Please excuse the get up because I've got like... I'm not properly dressed. 
So, puppy, we don't have any treats, so we'll make do with what we've got. Come here. <laughs> I love the leggings, Lois. That's me. It's like proper get up right here, isn't it? Yes. Oh my gosh, we're seeing the sea of dogs. I love this. Sea of dogs, sea of dogs. Yeah. They're all jumping up. I love this. Now, listen, she is just a young dog. She wouldn't have a clue what this means. Come on, come on. Come on, do it. You are. There you go. Oh, she's going Good luck getting calm again, Lois. You're fine. <laughs> when they go down, they get a they get the scratch along their side, and I go down a bit more to their level or bend over, and it's more of that. I think my body signals it as much as just saying down, mm -hmm. and that does make a difference. But they all know coming up. And they all know what it means. It's great for me. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That's really cool. Thank you. In action. Yeah. I would also say, and Vicky probably done this in her classes, is I love Vicky step up. So when you have like one of those yeah. yoga bar, yoga, yeah. So you can also so if he's doing that, then you can go step up and redirect onto like because that's feet onto something, and he's getting rewarded. And then you can get it down on the floor, you know, and then that scratch. So again, Lois didn't use any treats there. So there's another way if you've got a fussy dog, is you can use like touch as that rewarding thing, never as punishment, of course, but you know, you wouldn't be doing that anyway. Because I think with, with by what I'm feeling in is more like, maybe you need to be giving more boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, not less, but you can do that in a really kind and really like clear way. I think there's quite this negative connotation come up around boundaries, that boundaries are automatically a bad thing and they're not. Um, we can teach them in a really, really nice, easy way with a lot of positive reinforcement to show them that actually it's it's a good place to be and it's what we want. Um, and they do need a level of boundaries to help them make the right choices that we want and to keep them safe. Boundaries is just a safety thing more than anything else. Um, you don't have any yet, do you? No. <laughs> And that den or that place is that boundary place, of getting them used to it, also getting them used to like having a short boundary of where they stay on there and they enjoy it or they get something to do on there and then release and then back on and then release, you know, that would also, I hope this has been helping, Karen. Yeah, no, I think it has. Yeah, I'd love to watch it back, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least it's recorded. So yeah. that, yeah. Do you have some questions for us? I think. I think you've you've covered it really yeah um now I can't think of anything <laughs> okay cool so yeah just to like recap I guess what you can work at is I think the nutrition and the tummy because like if you've got a sort mm. you've got digestive issues <coughs> I do I can tell you how it feels yeah. I mean maybe you guys have it too but it's like it feels uncomfortable and an inflamed and a bit and like sometimes you can feel like the bloated hardness of when it's really bad um, but there's just this constant, like, mm, just not quite, it's not quite comfortable. Um, so yeah, exploring that. I mean, Greens in New Milton is a great place that you can go in and talk to Rachel and Tammy, and they sell lots of supplements and different things. They may advise mm -hmm. like, probiotic, possibly a soil-based one, or they might, advise, yeah, they may even advise some cod liver oil or oily, oily supplement stuff. Um, Omega-3 rather than cod liver oil. Sorry, I always call it cod liver oil, but omega-3 stuff. Um, yeah, and but yeah, I would, I would look at that piece and then I would also look at the setup of your house and setting up that den. Those would be the first kind of things that I would do. If you are home cooking for dogs, Dr. Basco is this amazing vet. We call him the surfing vet. He's like, I think he was originally from California and now he's in Hawaii, but he has this big recipe book of like home cooking which is quite easy um and then there's another lady i can't remember but maybe uh, guys if you're watching if you have some cookery book for dogs that would be that would be good um 
I mean, I would say come down a canine self-selection route because he's a perfect candidate for that in terms of treating the body through natural remedies as well. So nutrition and then remedy. Um, and then, yeah, looking at that feeling safe. So if it's worse at nighttime, I would really be looking at making him feel comfortable. So oh, sorry, Merlin's playing with a game. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. But um, you can, as dusk is happening, as you know, night is coming, you can set him up feeling really comfortable in that den or doing the enrichment and, re and reassure him that like once, it's like that aha moment, once you know what it is and then you're saying the right things, maybe they don't understand the words, but they understand the energy of you're safe, I'm safe, you know, if there's anything they're picking up from you guys um and creating that feeling of safety so dogs like generally like to have something over them you know or in a corner like lois said there's a feeling of like structure and safety in a smaller space not the whole space of the whole house we might be like oh you know i've got to defend boundaries or things like that um but then he can come in and out of so it's not like we're going to just corner him in like yeah and block him off um and what else do we talk about, Lois? Am I just trying to sum it up? Is there anything else? No, I think that was it. Yeah. And the kind of like dropping things or closing off things if it's not the behavior that you want and then redirect and... Can you guys hear that? Yeah. <laughs> it's really loud. He's got one of those, those toys that you... you pan it and then it throws out all of the biscuits but anyway <laughs> that would be a great time should not have filled that up just before note to oneself um cool well on that note um yeah and any questions karen you can ask us you can email or comment on this live video um and this video will go onto the website so i'll send you the link so that you can watch it back and it might be feel a bit overwhelming because also we're live in the group and stuff, so yeah, if you have questions after, then uh, then ask away. But yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. And is Kane, have, have we got a chance of seeing Kane? Is he... He's still on my feet. Coming up. Kane. 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 Come here. Oh. Let me get her. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Ah, you see now, a biscuit oh. like that is probably not going to do it for Kane. No, no, it's not. <laughs> That's like the lowest value <laughs> of... <laughs> So it's brown. No, he's not. He's not gonna. No, come. Never no, mind. Gonna Maybe come. pop a picture of him in the group, and then I yeah. can share it. But anyway, cool. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, thank Lois. You. Um, yeah, everyone is watching. Um, or watching on the replay. If you would like an online consultation, get hold of Lois. She is taking over from them for our group. Um, and um, I'm offering some telephone consultations, but um, not, not really at the moment. So yeah, please get hold of Lois. I'll put her details. Um, and yeah, I hope you got something from this. Yes, I'm thank go you very much. Quickly now before Merlin makes more noise. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can get hold of Lois at Yanni's Friends on Facebook. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Thank you guys. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.